Oh, I think I'm here. Hello, everybody. I uh, just want to do a quick video. I haven't been, I haven't been to my prayer spot in a long time. This is it. You see it. I can see it behind me. Uh, I wasn't going to make a video today, but whenever I'm a little upset, I make videos. Oh, I got a nice stick here. Found a little stick. But it's nothing that today, uh, the day I make this, if, if it's a teaching video, you ain't getting them till about a week later. But I was mad because somebody was, when I was coming to my prayer spot, besides the other things, I saw somebody was at my spot like fishing. There was a truck there. And I was just going to come right here and talk like, say, this is my prayer spot, you know, on the video, even if he was fishing. But I guess he, he left before I got here, right a minute ago. <laughs> um, oh, today, it's not a big thing, but it deals with recovery and all. Uh, today I was doing some work. Uh, working on the website. It's about 11. It's about 11 o'clock, and my routine is I, I'm not in Flower Bluff anymore. A lot of the people that I've known, you know, for a while, they don't see me here anymore for reasons you might know about, but they don't. All of them don't know why. So, but anyway, Jimmy, I'm helping Jimmy. Look, he didn't want to mention anything. Jimmy basically relapsed, but it was kind of obvious to me he did the time in Charlie's and so uh, Jimmy's very disorganized a lot of people on the street that know Jimmy who are also using and all a lot of them get fed up with Jimmy because he's got the ADD and all this and so I feel bad to see him back he had his apartment he had a lot of things going for him and all of that is now gone and understand but it takes patience to be with some of the guys and Jimmy's one of those guys so this morning I was doing a little work and he just came by at about maybe nine o'clock and I was in the yard building a fence fixing a fence so come on Jim I'll change my schedule today to run with you and maybe we'll go see David Martin maybe we'll go and do a fellowship but he has no order at all and that's I know this already now, one of the other pet peeves is I used to let the guys borrow the phone if they had to make, you know, important calls, which Jimmy did. He had about five calls, the DA, the lawyer, food stamp thing, this one, that one, the church is helping to get his ID. I've seen all this before. He's been through all this before. And then he got it. So I had a, I didn't realize my daughter was sitting in the living room. But she heard me kind of jump on Jimmy pretty bad. Not physically, but I finally, you know, I said, look. You know, I said, what happened was I let him do nothing. Jimmy is, you know, he talks like sometimes I've got this going on and Jimmy's not like that. He's kind of somewhat of a pushover, I would say, from the various people I know. The other guy I almost got in a fight with. A few months back, I told that story. That guy back down, you know, he's in prison. I did, I learned today. He was the one that murdered my other friend because he had a history of violence. This other guy. I told that story one day. I was I don't want to tell it again, but I just found out today that he's the one that uh, got charged with killing my friend Don. Because he'd like this guy always like to fight. That's the whole problem with the guys in the street. And so he backed down. He was going to start something with me one day. And I said, "You go first. I was mad that day. So that's how they are. Some of the guys. And you know, Proverbs says there's violence, there's crime. The big problem is they have to stop being like that. That's the big problem. But Jimmy's not like that. But I got upset because I figured if. I told him already, I said, I'm not going to let you guys use the phone no more, Jimmy, because I get people texting me back. And... But he had to make about five, six calls, like I mentioned. He didn't make any bad calls because they tell him, I don't want you calling your girlfriend because it's a whole problem with, you. you know, come back here, losing everything, and just, will you take me back again, all that codependency AA does not help he look he was doing the program and he relapsed doing the program 
I never told him to stop the program. He already relapsed on his own. But, so then it went for a couple, I was helping Jimmy this morning. I was still going to take him with me. I'm heading into town. And I tell him, I'm not in the bluff. I go into town. I'm not around here anymore. I said, but maybe we'll do a little meeting. Maybe see David Martin and all. And then it went from that to he forgot all the stuff he's trying to get back, his papers, social security papers. Oh, 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 Johnny, Johnny. He's like panicky, Jimmy. Oh, quick, I got to go. You got to take me to a couple of houses here in the bluff where I don't go no more. Even just to ride with him, I don't do that. Parking in front of houses, you know, where people are using and all, even if he just had to go. I'm sure he lost everything that he needed, which he was making fun. So, I, he, but it was like a child. Oh, no, no, please, oh, oh you got to take me. So I had to jump on him, you know. I said, look, you got to understand. Uh, I went out of my way today, but every time, Jimmy, I said, you had everything organized, you had everything together. You're now back in the same boat where I was a year ago. I'm still going to, was going to help you. I still, if you want, you can. But now, all of a sudden, from using the phone, which I really didn't want you to do, then all of a sudden something's missing. You got to take me like a child, like panicking, you know. Oh, I got to go. You got to take. I said, look. So I jumped him a little bit, you know, yelled at him. And then I realized my daughter's sitting in the other room. So <laughs> that's the problem. The problem is, uh, you know, I try to tell the guys, what is your goal today? What is your mission today? Are you letting all of the other things drive you? Whatever you have to get done today, it, it, it's really useless spending all this time trying to get back in the food stamps or they're going to increase it back. I said, you're going to, even if you got all that done, which I spent, you know, months helping you do a year ago get in the apartment the VA apartment, I took them all over looking at apartments, I did all that with him, got the apartment, he had it, it was beautiful, he lost it all, now look, I was still willing to help him, and I'm still going to help him, but I told him just now, I said, look, I'm going into town after I jumped on him, I said, but this whole thing, Jimmy, you're back, you should have finished the program, stayed with it, he kind of told me reasons why, you know, the Part of recovery is you become responsible, you grow up. Even some of my friends that finally stopped using, they're still not responsible, some of them. They never learn to transition into a responsible life. I remember, sir, this is not meant to be a critique of AA, but it's happening every now and then. But even in some of the meetings I did in uh, New Jersey, there were some guys in the meetings that I remember, and some of them were like, oh, you know, my wife or people tell me you should get a job, and he was a regular person, I don't remember his name. And I thought, man, this guy don't have a job, because <laughs> he goes to every AA meeting. <laughs> you gotta, and he might be clean, I, look, you, you gotta transition, that's all. The big thing today. So if it's a teaching video, <laughs> it'll be, uh, I just finished the book of Thessalonians, okay, First Thessalonians, and I also am beginning the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, a great romantic love story, but the last uh, chapter I read yesterday, or First Thessalonians 5, I would have hit on this if I was kind of teaching it. Paul says, look, look, now the Apostle Paul is talking to Christians, and he says, as you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. The day of the Lord is something we can do a whole study on. But just listen to that, the verse I quoted. He told those Christians in the first century, he said, as you yourselves also know, you know it perfectly. How did they know that? How did they know that the day of the Lord comes in a flash and in a moment, like Jesus said, 
the kingdom is like lightning from one end of heaven all the way to the other. How did they know that, John? The day of the Lord is not only the coming of the Lord physically, which we look forward to in the second coming of Christ. The day of the Lord also are His comings throughout the history of man. When I just finished the prophet Joel, teaching a little bit of Joel, the day of the Lord and those prophets were kind of dual, dualistic, meaning you get prophecies in the Old Testament, for instance, that speak of Solomon. David makes the promise, uh, God makes the promise to King David, your son's going to build the temple, he's going to build the house. Now those prophecies were fulfilled through Solomon, David's natural physical son at that time, but those same prophecies are fulfilled through Christ, building the spiritual temple, the son of David. Okay, so in the day of the Lord uh, teaching in Scripture, you have a time, the final judgment, it's going to be a day where we all stand before God. But you also have days throughout the history of men where God has come and judged. And a very good example of this would be in the parables. I've been hitting on some of the parables. Maybe I'll mention this the day of the Lord, okay? I don't want to mention it the day I jumped on Jimmy's ass. So, the day of the... I don't think... Look, I've been into it much worse with other guys than that. But I don't think Jimmy's going to see me jump his ass. <laughs> so, got a little scared of that. The day of the Lord. <laughs> in the parables of Jesus in the New Testament. He gives parables, listen preachers, where those parables, most of us are looking at as the final judgment, the day of the Lord. But also, most of us would understand that in those parables, he also says things like, what will, the, what will the king do when he comes back? And he says things like, he will judge them, destroy them, and burn up their city and come and bring judgment. Now Jesus was speaking those parables in about A.D. 30. And 40 years later, all scholars, even those who are considered not preterists, okay, I don't do it all. Those who are normal dispensationalists, in a sense, meaning they're still looking for all those things to take place. Even those scholars will all agree when Jesus says that he will come and burn up their city. All of them understand that that took place at the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. So most Bible preachers understand that when Jesus at times talked about his coming, the coming of the day of the Lord and judgment, many understand that some of those took place. Okay? Now, preterism is a view where certain scholars believe all of the terminology about the coming and everything, even the resurrection, all already took place. I don't hold to that view. But they will point to things like that. Meaning you could find Old Testament prophets using the exact same wording about the return of Christ, the day of the Lord and judgment, and they're referring to judgments that already took place. That's in scripture. I can't do that all. So now remember Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5. He says, the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. And he told them, as you know it. How did they know? Paul had a day of the Lord in his life. Paul the Apostle. He was out persecuting Christians. He was convinced that his religious point of view as a Pharisee was the right one. And he was so convinced that he felt, quote, he was doing God's service by killing the followers of Jesus. And Jesus prophesied that same thing in the parables. A day is coming when those who are killing you will think that they're doing it for God. 
with deception, with deception. And I recently applied that to even some of us in the church today who actually think killing is the will of God in these types of interventions. I don't want to do too much politics on this. But the day of the Lord comes to all of us. And Paul had it because he was in the middle of that persecution of the Christians. We read the famous conversion in Acts chapter 9 where Jesus intervened. Paul is the great theologian that teaches the doctrine of sovereignty and predestination, which I believe in. But why, I've wondered, you know, why is he so strong? Paul's conversion was not, if you want to accept Jesus into your heart, you got to... Paul's conversion was, he had no intent on being converted. Like the great 4th, 5th century church father, St. Augustine. God, God just stopped Paul in his tracks and said, I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. And he was blind. He was knocked off his, the proverbial horse. And he was blinded. And then God sent him to a house. And the man was afraid to get to receive Paul. He was an early Christian. And he said, no, no. God gave the man a vision, said, he's, he's called of me. God says, I'm calling Paul. I'm bringing him in. And he was baptized and scales fell from his eyes. He was blind for three days. And God opened Paul's eyes. And it showed him the reality of Christ like none of the other apostles had that type of understanding that Paul had. So that was Paul's day of the Lord. And he told the Thessalonians, You'll have a day too. There's a prophecy about Jesus that says, Whoever falls on this stone will be broken. Jesus in the conversion of Paul said, It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks or the goads. It's hard for you, Paul, to keep resisting God. And so God made him willing. God made him willing. And so, after just jumping on Jimmy, I was just upset because when when kids want something, and, and it started, I knew it was going to progress to that. started about two hours, I, so I was with him at the house, let him, I changed my schedule somewhat just to, we'll do something different today. Let him use the phone. And then it went from that to the moment he realized he lost some paperwork. Oh, I got to go to two ladies' houses here in the bluff here where I don't go no more. I said, it started, Jimmy, with you, you know. And then it progressed to, you got to do this. You, you know, he's not tough, Jimmy, okay. But he's like, oh, please, you know what I'm saying? Just like a kid. When a child, when a child, uh, you know, it, they can't get what they want. Oh, maybe I got a nice ribbon. I've been showing you all types of little... It's tequila. I don't know what kind of sign that... I find stuff. You saw the ring. By now, you saw the... The ace of spades. <laughs> it's a little well. I walk out here. I refer to this as Jacob's well. Somebody blocked it up. But I call this Jacob's well. Just as a reminder when I'm out here. If I were going to do Ruth, I mean, I'm reading it. It's a cool story. The book of Ruth in the Old Testament. And Ruth is a... In, in the first chapter we read... Th this family from Judah. There's a famine in the land. And they go to... Moab. Moab is one of those wicked places. I talked about it in Judges, actually. And, on, and they're going to go down there because there's a family. And so the husband and wife and sons decide the, that these are Jews. They decide to go into this non-Jewish area called Moab. And they're there for 10 years. I just read it. I, should, I didn't study it like I was going to teach it. 
and, and over time, the sons of this Jewish family, and the mother's name was uh, Naomi, Naomi. And the sons of this Jewish family that went down to Moab, they got married while they were there for 10 years. And sadly, the woman's husband died, and the two sons died. And, and she describes it in Ruth chapter 1. Naomi says, The hand of God has turned against me for evil. The day of the Lord. And she said, This has happened to me. So her two daughter-in-laws, who married the sons, she says to the daughter-in-laws, Everything has gone to hell for me. I'm going to go back to my homeland, back to Judah, back to Israel. And, and these two uh, daughter-in-laws, she releases them and says, go. But Ruth, one of the daughter-in-laws, says, no, I'm going to stay with you. She, Ruth must have seen something in that family that worshipped the true God. Yahweh. mother-in-law and the mother-in-law keeps saying what can I offer you even if I were to remarry which is doubtful I would have children but even if I had one they would be young would you wait all these years for another son but Ruth says no your God is my God I, I, I'm coming and that's the beginning of the book of Ruth the day of the Lord again I guess it was said and, and, it's, and we're going to read it if I cover some more of the book of Ruth. It's a great story about redemption, really. It's a great story about God redeeming his people. Bringing a people unto himself. We read about Boaz and the kinsman redeemer. And, uh, maybe if I do it, I'll do it some more. But for today, let them keep that in your head. First, read that. I'll try and post that one verse. Jimmy had the day of the Lord in a very small degree about an hour ago. <coughs> I'll try and post it. <coughs> Paul said, 1 Thessalonians 5, The day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. For when they will say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman which child, and they will not escape. They will not escape when that day comes. And Paul said, as you know, perfectly. Because we can have that day now. Jesus said, whoever falls on this stone will be broken. Speaking of himself. The cornerstone. The stone that the builders rejected. If you bow to him now, you're still going to be broken. You'll be broken because you'll submit to him. You won't be in rebellion anymore. But if you don't submit in this life, it says whoever that stone falls on will grind him to powder. You can have your day of the Lord by just understanding that you've been a rebel if you are one. And you got to submit. You say, I like, I enjoy my extracurricular activities. I've had, I have too many friends, some who claim Christian. We believe sleeping around is, it feels good. And look, the scripture says, those that do those things cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Just as, just as much as addiction and alcohol and drugs will keep you out. Sleeping around will. You either get married, have a legitimate spouse, or you don't do anything. That's the scripture teaches keep going for a certain time, it says in Revelation, uh, there were those there that taught the doctrine of Balaam, the rebuke of the churches, who permits fornication of Jezebel to seduce my soul, it says, should be cast into a bed and those who are fornicating with her to judgment. The day of the Lord, and it comes like a thief in the night. People will say, oh, everything is going good. Jesus talked about that in the parables. He talked about it as, as in the days of Lot and as in the days of Noah. They thought everything was going good. And Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And they heard him 
giving warnings as he was building some crazy ark for a long period of time. And they just got, oh, I found something. See? You're going to see all types of wonderful... You see me find this real time. I don't know, it looks like some type, it might be a Christian thing. Gifts. Gifts come in. And, and, and they were all doing what they were doing for years and years and years. I told Jimmy today. I said, Jimmy, all these guys in the bluff, you guys, many of them, drugs, alcohol, crime, stealing. John, you defend a lot of people that are in trouble. You, are you justifying their lives? No. No. Crime is wrong, whether it's by a cop or whether it's by people committing crimes. It's wrong all the way around. And the, and the reason some cops do that, one of the sites, one of the links I planted, with some police officers, not here, but it was a link somewhere else. It said they actually believed that planting of evidence and all was an aggressive way of policing. That's what was happening here. Some officers wanted the guys off the streets because of the constant. They're in jail, they're back here again, they're in jail, they're back here. And they got tired of it. And I understand that. I get it. And so they did aggressive policing. In some cases, cross the line, like I shared. But those guys are not justified either. I mean, the ones that were evidence planted, yes, they were. Because you should never do that. It's, it's, it's just a whole symbol of the disorganization, mismanagement of the city, which you saw through the parable of the water boy. So, I got me a nice little thing. I found another thing. <laughs> Jesus says, okay, we'll end with that. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I hope I caught some, some fish today. <laughs>